Hello, everyone out on Facebook Live uh, through Cincinnati Public Schools. I am Josh Harden, the CPS Athletics Manager, and I'd like to welcome everyone to our first session of Beyond the Game. This is our new series where we'll dive deeper into being a student athlete and go beyond the sports that we may coach or play. Today, we're going to be talking about mental health. In sports, we know the importance of mental toughness focus, and concentration, but we also know that there are many factors that are impacting the busy lives of our student athletes on a daily basis, and even more so through the pandemic that can affect mental health. The World Health Organization discusses mental health in terms of a state of well-being. Individuals with strong mental health realize their ability and can cope with everyday stresses in their life. And they say a person's physical health and social situations can positively or negatively impact their mental health and vice versa. Anyone in athletics has probably heard the phrase, just do it, push through the pain. And whereas we want to encourage our student athletes and help them believe they can do anything they put their mind to, we also want to emphasize and encourage them to share how they're feeling and then allow us to support them as needed. The district athletics office, we have collaborated with one in five green builders, women helping women, mind peace, healthy visions, just to name a few of our supportive partners. We have also designated a staff member to oversee and support the growth and impact of our health and safety initiatives. Asia Bradford has been leading these efforts and I'm happy to have her come on and introduce our partners for today that will be presenting and leading the discussion. Asia? Thank you, Josh. Again, my name is Asia Bradford, and I serve as one of the assistant athletic directors for Cincinnati Public Schools. I oversee mental health and nutrition, and hence the reason that we are here today. Uh, we are very excited to align our mental health and wellness initiatives to align them with uh, our district strategic plan to elevate the social, emotional well-being and the physical health of our student athletes. Today, for our first Beyond the Game uh, series of this season, of this year rather, uh, we've partnered with Walton Mobile Healthcare Solutions to bring you Beyond the Game. Let's talk mental health. So now I'll introduce Steve Ellison, Wanna Hills Athletic Director and partner with Walton Mobile Healthcare Solutions. Thank you, Asia. I appreciate that. Uh, hello, uh, Facebook world and, and Walnut. Uh, I'm sorry, Cincinnati Public Schools um, participants and, and families. Uh, I'm excited today to, to be able to uh, to introduce a, a, a dynamic speaker, not not only someone that I know professionally, but personally as well. Um, Walt Mobile Healthcare Solutions is a, uh, a mobile uh, primary care practice that, that focuses on the, the total you. And uh, this series today uh, goes right in line with what, what we preach as a, as a practice and as, a, as an organization in regards to making sure that uh, we're not only focusing on our physical health, uh, but our mental health, our emotional health, and our, um, and our total well-being. So uh, without further ado, I want to introduce our speaker for today, um, who will bring some good information um, in front of us so that we uh, can have some different things to, to be able to discuss and talk about uh today uh, i want to introduce it to you uh sean, sean walton senior uh sean was a champion power lifter and a two-time state amateur and pro division am wrestling champion uh, at the age of 25 he experienced a career ending shoulder injury which left him depressed and searching for a new purpose he became a certified fitness instructor through the international sports science association 1996 six, which marked his official transition from devastated award-winning student athlete to successful fitness weight loss, and general wellness specialists. Don's newfound purpose allowed him to serve hundreds of grateful clients ranging from individuals who simply desire to do a healthier life to elite athletes. He served five years as a director of youth and youth adult ministries at Grace Church in Dayton, Ohio. Don is a former program director of the Community Initiative to Reduce Gun Violence and Community Police Council for the City of Dayton's Human Relations Council. He was a director of youth initiatives for a community action partnership of Greater Dayton area for nearly a decade. He oversaw vital youth and family programs for this organization, one of which was a CAP Youth Empowerment Center, 
the winner of, of the two best practice awards. Uh, so without further ado, I want to pass it along to our uh, speaker for this evening, uh, Sean Walton Sr. Alrighty, thank you, Steve. I definitely appreciate your introduction and uh, you are a brilliant man uh, to uh, kind of digest that little tidbit I gave you just moments before we started, okay? So, so good stuff. Um, wanna uh, thank everybody for allowing me to uh, share with you a little bit. Um, in addition to some of the things that Steve mentioned, I became a mental health first aid certified um, facilitator. And mental health, youth mental uh, health first aid, is essentially, it takes kind of that big ball of information that professionals have, and it gives us a framework in order to address youth mental health uh, kind of across the broader community so that young people have inroads and exit uh, ramps uh, to mental health, right? So young people have inroads to mental health when they maybe think that they may be experiencing mental health challenges, or they may just not know um, enough about mental health to even, uh, you know, kind of explore that as an option. Now, one great thing I enjoy about Youth Mental Health First Aid, you can feel free to, you know, just Google it, Youth Mental Health First Aid, and I recommend that uh, folks uh, kind of connect with Youth Mental Health First Aid. It's a great, um, it's a great tool. We will not be using that tool today. That would take us about five hours longer than we actually have. So we will spare you that portion, uh, but we've got a great panel that we'll get to in just a little bit. I uh, just wanted to do a, a few housekeeping notes and uh, just share a brief story about kind of, kind of the gaps with that journey that perhaps uh, you didn't gather from the uh, snippet that Steve uh, read. One is I wanna let you know that in the chat, if you look in the chat uh, before long, you will see uh, the suicide prevention hotline information. We should actually call that, it's already branded, but it's more of a mental health access hotline. So during our conversation and some of the things that we may talk about uh, around mental health, you know, things like substance misuse, a suicide will come up. If you feel uncomfortable in any way, if you feel like you need to take a break, uh, step away, also know that there are folks who can uh, talk to you. And if you're experiencing what you think uh, through our conversation is unhealthy crisis, feel free to talk to those folks. And just because it's called Suicide Prevention Hotline doesn't mean that you have to be at the, at the uh, place where you're having uh, suicidal thoughts, suicidal ideations, but you may just want to kind of assess where you are. So understanding that, but uh, starting out, um, I was a young person, like many of the folks that we'll be talking about today in high school. I was an outstanding high school athlete. I was kind of a late bloomer, but I, I was a decent high school wrestler and started to do more things as life kind of moved on. Uh, one of the things that made me passionate about mental health is skipping down the journey I spent some time working with young people in multiple different environments. Uh, we mentioned youth ministry. We also mentioned uh, the Youth Empowerment Center, uh, which we also were adding in a mental, health, a mental health component many, many years ago before it was kind of a popular thing. I was trying to kind of lead the conversation in that particular direction. But, you know, we got some pushback because we didn't have tools and outlets uh, like we have today to help folks understand uh, that mental health is a very real thing and as important as physical health. But I suffered with high school depression. I never knew that. I had no idea that I was a depressed high school student until I was an adult, until I started to learn more about mental health in the process of thinking that I was teaching other folks that I didn't realize how I had been impacted by things throughout my life. Trauma, trauma experiences, physical trauma, all of those things that can uh, cause damage to our mental health, you know, can cause us to struggle. I mean, I was really um, uh, moderately and at times severely depressed in high school. Fast forward a little bit. Um, I was a few short years out of high school, you know, was kind of searching for purpose. And this is where this is really important for our athletes. Here I was a few years out trying to cope with what that next move was. Found powerlifting, became a late bloomer, became a 
big power lifter and that sort of thing, had a 500 plus pound bench press, 700 pound squat, all that great stuff. Uh, decided that, uh, um, in that powerlifting arena that there was a uh, too much, too much steroid use. You know, wasn't certain that I could make it even in those natural ranks. And for me, that was a, that was a hard hit. You know, I thought I had found something. So I was, I had a crossroads. You know, I had a decision to make. I could stay in a sport where uh, I thought would actually lead me to using steroids. I was as big as I could get. Uh, is, you know, I'm, I'm kind of long. I don't know if you can tell, but I'm a little long. I was almost 270 pounds at that time, yet my arms were still incredibly long. So when I would go into meets and there, there was a guy that would come over there and I didn't look exactly clean, right? I had a choice. I could stay in that sport and blow up to perhaps 300 pounds because I was already near 270 pounds in order to make the gap up and perhaps that still not work or I could use some performance enhancers. I opted not to use performance enhancers. Now, before we clap, understand that that came up with, that came with a psychological cost because I was losing purpose as I moved along. I was kind of finding my way through. I had parents, but my parents were disconnected from athletics, right? So I found arm wrestling. It was the most wonderful thing ever. I'm leaning forward, leaning on a gym counter. I had a dream, true story, okay? I am a storyteller, however, I the difference, okay? Storytelling is an art form. I'm not a liar, I'm a storyteller. True story, I was leaning down and my elbow was on an arm wrestling flyer. Uh, I just dreamed about it the night before. I dreamed that I was arm wrestling. I actually arm wrestled for my first girlfriend in kindergarten. Call it chauvinistic, but that's what I knew at five years old, right? But I won too, I did, I did. So this was this connection and I was always a great arm wrestler, but I didn't understand anything about professional arm wrestling, but I had my elbow on it. I dreamed about it. This must be the place for me. Wow, this is amazing. So immediately I called and got signed up. Couldn't find anybody to train with. I lined guys up in the gym. They were willing victims and I was grateful for them to solve their pride. And I was just laying them down. I was laying them down, laying them down. Showed up at the uh, meet. It was the Dukes of Dayton meet. Popped in unheard of, unknown, unknown, they gave me a nickname. I was that good right off. They called me Flash. I won the tournament, immediately qualified for the Ohio State tournament. Second meet ever in my entire life. I go into the meet. I have found my purpose. I am an arm wrestler, right? This is me, of course. You know, I've got a nickname. I think they called me Flash or something. It was a long time ago. I'm 53, forgive me. But so as we were moving through, I, um, I encountered a national champion and an amateur world champion. I experienced some different things. It was a rough road. You know, I had some minor injuries, things like that. However, I literally popped Motrin, chewed them up, and soaked them under my tongue. I was completely committed. I was going to fight through the pain. Call it foolish, but I wanted to continue to move. Made it through that tournament and actually won the state on my first time out. Took a year off, went to West Virginia, went to the pro division, went through them like what's called a hot knife through butter. That's a country saying, young people, but a hot knife through butter, absolutely. Beat a guy off a tour bus. It was wonderful. I was right there at the top of my game. They were talking about bringing arm wrestling to the Olympics. And I came back to Dayton, Ohio, to take my state, my Ohio State title back. And first match out, pop. I felt my deltoid roll up into my shoulder. I literally felt my pectoral pull away. I felt my bicep pull away from the bone. I knew in my heart, I wasn't injured, I was done. But I was so good. We had interviews, I had television interviews and this sort of thing, big exposés, I mean, this thing was huge. And I can remember the thought as I left that arena thinking, and where do I go from here? I showed up at my victory party. Hear what I'm saying? Was that good? I walked under a huge banner with a sling on my arm, defeated, not because I had lost a match, but because I knew rightfully I may never be able to compete again. Sure enough, um, flash forward, I fell into depression at that moment, and it was tough. It was tough. Now imagine me at 21, 22 years old, trying to deal with 
trying to find my way throughout life. I put so much work into my physical body. I was an academic early on, but you know how we shift. You know, we move away from academics a little bit and we move towards what people are standing up in the stands for, right? But hey, they're standing up in the stands for athletics. I figured it out real early in life, switched from academics to, ath to athletics. But when that went away from me, I was absolutely devastated, folks. I mean, I was devastated. And to show up to this victory party, surprise party, by the way, all my friends were there, friends I grew up with, yet I, the most, I guess, tragic thing was I knew it was over with for me. It was, you'll get them next time. And I said, no, Sean, you won't get them next time. You are injured, career ending injury. So with that, I kind of um, floundered throughout life quite a while, uh, fell into a depression again. And, uh, you know, it, 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 it kind of woke things up for me. So two things I walked away with this. So this is a story of tragedy. One is I began to recognize that I had a challenge that I needed purpose in life. I not only found my purpose through uh, becoming a fitness, uh, lifestyles and wellness coach, I also found my um, purpose in working with young people. And what I found in working with young people from all walks of life, athletes, um, uh, uh, entertainers, uh, academics, young people who actually didn't have a place to fit. I found out that mental health and depression and anxiety was far a far larger issue than anyone would have ever thought. So that is the short version, believe it or not, short version of what brought me to the space where I am. And recently, I just decided, since I do have a community leadership voice, um, I've sat on advisory boards and this sort of thing. I've worked in uh, in juvenile corrections, and there's a high incident of young people who are uh, in juvenile corrections. We always talk about adults that are in corrections, adult with mental health issues that are in corrections. Uh, but there's also a high incident of young people. So I worked with Center for Adolescent Services, designing therapy to recreation programs for them. Um, I've worked at St. Joseph's Children's Treatment Center way back when they used to diagnosed as severely behaviorally handicapped. Um, so I've had a different view and I've worked with coaches and athletes as well. And uh, so it's a pleasure to be here today. And I did take the leap recently to become certified, a certified mental youth mental health first aid facilitator. So that's what brings me here and enough of me. I will have an opportunity to uh, open the floor to our panel and we're gonna have some folks introduce themselves. And uh, why don't we start with, uh, we have Ricardo here. Ricardo on the line. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for just sharing your story as well. Uh, my name is Ricardo Hill. I'm the head boys uh, varsity basketball coach at Wanda Hills High School. Um, and ready to, to absorb as much information I can and help our student athletes as, as much as possible. Thank you for having me. Great. Let's, let's try Jacqueline. How about Jacqueline? Hi, thanks for having me. My name's Jacqueline Hammersmith. Myself and my other colleague that's on here, Dr. Craig Hanthorn, we um, just a couple months back collaborated to open our own business um, called Performance Psychology. And um, we've been working with um, Cincinnati Public Schools to support our student athletes and um, just addressing everything that you talked about, really just removing barriers and um, working on their mental so that they can be successful at school and outside of school and on the field everywhere. Thank you, thank you so much. Tiffany. Do not have, do we have Tiffany here? Okay, I'm scrolling through. Uh, we will try, and, and please correct me if I pronounce your name wrong, Yermaya? Yeah, that's correct. Great. I'm Yermaya Israel, and I'm a two-sport athlete here at Walnut. Um, as somebody who battles with mental, mental health challenges, I'm glad to be a part of the family. Bravo. Bravo, you're my uh, full disclosure, yep. Re reducing stigma. Thank you for being an example. Uh, let's try it now. I, I've got to get this right. Annalise. 
Hi, I'm Annalise. I am a junior at Walnut Hills. Um, I'm a student athlete as well. Um, my sport is swimming. And as he said, as someone who's experienced people who've struggled with mental health, I'm very happy to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, did I have a, what about Craig? Did I already, no, I didn't, I did not go to Craig. Oh, Dr. Craig, you didn't get a chance to introduce yourself as a matter of fact. We heard about uh, you. Yes, how are y'all doing? Um, I'm Dr. Craig Canthorn. I am a sports psychologist, um, as well as uh, coach JV and varsity assistant basketball at Western Hills High School in CPS. Great, thank you. And we have, trying to look at faces, make certain that I don't, uh, miss anyone? Uh, did I go? I already did Ricardo. Uh, Brent. Brent. Hey, everyone. Uh, Brent Langhorn. Uh, I work in the CPS athletics office, elementary athletics coordinator. So work with our young people throughout CPS, K through second grade programming, and uh, also have some family members, um, you know, with, with some mental health challenges and, and even myself. So just happy to be here, absorb some information and provide as much you know, feedback and, and learn from you all as much as I can. Okay, thank you. Um, I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, the only person that I missed was Tiffany, I, I believe, uh, is it Jarrell? Did I get Jarrell? Jarrell Redden? I feel like I'm calling, uh, calling the list like I'm the teacher at the at the front of the classroom, Jarrell Redden, please raise your hand. Um, no, Tiffany. Okay, so have have I missed anyone? Please, please uh, don't hold your peace. Speak up. Great. Okay. Alrighty. Well, I've got a few points that I'd like to make certain that we hit, and we'll walk through some things as we um, as we kind of you know uh, set up a, a stage for our conversation. But I'd like to make certain that we uh, reinforce the critical need and, you know, make wellness a priority in our student athlete interactions. One of the things and kind of, you know, put that out there and just knowing that we do have some experts on the call. I let me be an example. I'm a regular guy who uh, became educated when it came to mental health. Uh, so we've got the regular folks on here. Don't feel like you uh, have to hold back because you're only talking about your own experience and your, and your experience with young people that you've worked with. So we want to you know, reinforce that critical need for wellness, a priority, uh, making certain that we make wellness a priority in our student athlete interactions, that sort of thing. We also wanna recognize those kind of undercover or subtle, overt, or, uh, subtle or overt, you know, really out front um, signs and symptoms that young people may be um, headed towards a mental health crisis, you know, or they may be off balance or um, their wellness may be in jeopardy. We also want to explore the benefits of promoting and fostering those environments that encourage, encourage self-identifying. Not necessarily self-diagnosing, but you recognize uh, in your own life and the folks around you when you see the signs and the symptoms of uh, perhaps anxiety, right, of depression, all of those sorts of things that we live in a world that we deal with today. And also we wanna make certain that we promote and foster environments that create multi-purpose young people, right? Multi-purpose young people, young people who not only just have to not stick to one sport, but young people who have uh, what I call inroads and exit ramps. You know, I love that analogy. Inroads and exit ramps to life just to experience life in different ways so that, you know, well, back in the day, we used to call it a plan A, a plan B, and a plan C, and sometimes a plan D, never a plan F. Um, and we also wanna uh, learn how to embrace our roles and responsibilities as worth of farmers, help, purpose, and hope providers. And this is from a coach's perspective, from an athlete's perspective, from a parent's perspective, wrap in a whole community, which are folks from, uh, like our folks from performance psychology, right? And mentors throughout the community. So good stuff. So just, I uh, wanna start out and uh, encourage us to not just float stats out there, but feel free to float some stats out there, but let's also introduce our audience to people. Now we wanna be safe about how we share stories. 
So any identifying information, for instance, if there's something that's currently going on, uh, kind of try to stay away from things that uh, might um, uh, that might um, violate a person's confidentiality and their right to privacy. Um, but there's a lot of other things going on. And if we have friends, we can also create the straw person, that kind of pretend, pretend person that has um, some of those experiences that may be similar to other people. Um, and we want to make certain that if we use um, any information, like if there are things that are in the news recent, like we may get a chance to talk about the impact of gun violence on mental health and how many of our athletes, uh, you know, these are, are their friends, their family members and that sort of thing. You can feel free to talk about things that are in the news, but let's just be, you know, sensitive about the fact that they may have relatives that are on the call. Good, thumbs up. Good, good, good stuff, good stuff. So I'll let anybody kind of chime in. Um, in your work, in your experience, in your peer relationships, young people, are you finding that, um, is there an increased awareness about mental health or is there an increased need? Because some folks think that, well, we're just talking about it more. It's always been there. So is there a increased or more critical need uh, to address mental health or is it just an increased awareness? Anyone? I feel like the awareness is a, a big part of it because it's always been here, but not everybody has took the time to acknowledge it. And being an athlete, it was always uh, be mentally tough, be the toughest out on the floor, this and that. So it kind of like holds people back from actually speaking up about what's going on within them. And then also people feeling alone or ostracized, so they didn't even feel comfortable enough to speak up about it. Well, well, well said. Well said, you're my someone else. Are we just talking about it more or is there a real increased need um, for uh, mental health support? I think there is also an in increase in the need for support because from what I've seen, I feel like people are having to do more and more for their college applications. So mm -hmm. they're stressing themselves, adding on more extracurriculars, sports, and tons of other stuff to make themselves look good and piling all that stresses them out and it makes their mental health not the best. So I feel like while the awareness is also increasing, the need is also increasing as well. That's a really helpful perspective because when we've got, um, even those of us who've done, and I, I mean, I was into this for years before it kind of got popular. I was glad that it got, it got popular, but I wasn't, you know, I wasn't excited about the fact that, you know, mental health was really suffering. You know, it seemed to be in need, at least to me. I was, um, um, Jeremiah and Annalise, do you, not to insult you, I was just kind of figuring out many years ago that LOL did not mean laugh out loud. So please give, forgive me for that. I thought for years uh, that it meant, no, excuse me, I thought that it meant lots of love. I really did, right? So I was just, I know, I know, feel free to laugh at me. I thought that it meant lots of love, so I'm not diminishing you by saying this, but do you know what a VHS is? What a VHS tape is, right? Yeah, I had some suicide prevention stuff, uh, information on a VHS tape. Now, I tell you, you would have been very frustrated because it would take you forever to get to the next thing. And if you were cheap like me, you put about three or four movies or five movies or documentaries on a VHS tape. So that's how long I've been interested in this. And I remember talking to a, Duke, a group of adult mentors really pushing why young people needed adults in their life, how it creates protective factors. We always talk about risk factors, but we don't always talk about protective factors. And I believe I was so early that I'm the reason that I didn't recruit one mentor that day. Because honestly, I think it was really heavy. You know, I talked about young people and at that time, an 11 year old who looked to be a seven year old completed suicide. And I think it was really, really heavy. So I'm glad that folks are willing to embrace this today. So um, Dr. Uh, is it Dr. Hammersmith? No, not yet. <laughs> okay, okay, that, that, that's that's okay. We're gonna we're gonna claim it. I'm I'm from the. I, I believe in speaking it into existence. However, I don't want to um to uh, frustrate or upset the other PhDs. Okay, so all right, uh, Jacqueline Hammersmith. 
in your experience, are, are you finding that, uh, what, what do you find with your athletes as far as increase? And let's talk about COVID and kind of wrap all of that in. Yeah. I mean, I definitely think it is a little bit of the mix of both that your Maya and Annalise both touched on. I do think COVID exemplified any issues that um, our young people were having. Um, so just all that time by themselves inside, you know, dealing with a lot of heavy issues that a lot of our young people deal with, um, you know, as far as like taking care of younger siblings, um, taking, taking up more of a, an adult role in the home. Um, so there were a lot of different issues that just were compounded because everybody, all the students who were home, um, our students, a lot of them like to come to school and um, all that time at home was really difficult. Their support systems are in the schools, teachers, um, support staff. So all that time away was really, really hard. And I think we're really seeing the impact on our young people um, right now, like they're struggling a lot. Um, I do think that the exposure of a lot of the professional athletes coming out and talking about mental health has been helpful to um, kind of address the stigma of mental health and um, really say, you know, it's okay to talk about, it's okay to be open about it. I do think we definitely need to do a better job with that because I do see a lot of um, students dealing with a lot of heavy stuff and kind of being so used to the environment of dealing with it all on the, their own, you know, being mentally tough and that meaning that they, you know, suck it up and deal with it by themselves and not reach out. So I think we need to do a lot better job of encouraging our young people to speak up and make sure that they know what resources are available because it's not all on them and they shouldn't have to deal with everything on, on their own. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Dr. Craig. Yeah, I think something that has become very um, evident during, okay, sorry, more please. It has become very evident during COVID was if you take the analogy of snowball effect, right? Um, mental health has always been something where it's been addressed. If you think of a student in school, mental health is ongoing, but they've had that strategy. No, thank you. Oh. They've had that strategy where they have people they can access in the building. Adults, typically we were going to work and whether they view that as a therapy, there's outlets being provided there. When we were at COVID, those outlets were taken away. So in regards to a snowball effect, you were able to kind of keep that snowball pretty minimal. You were um, being encouraged to use coping strategies you were having outlets, you were having social events. When we all went shut up in our house for nine months, your snowball effect kind of went into full effect. You were rolling down the hill, you weren't having the outlets, you weren't having the coping strategies reminded to you. Um, so I don't necessarily see mental health as something that took off times 10 over COVID. I see it more as we as a society learned that individually or independently is not enough to kind of overcome mental health, that that support system becomes important. Um, I also think you have to shout out adults. I think we have come into a, a time frame where adults were even seen, you know, that shut up, work hard mentality kind of went away because all of a sudden we saw a spike in adult mental health. Um, and adults were all of a sudden seeing that they needed the coping strategies and they needed assistance. So all of a sudden we have parents that are encouraging their kids to seek out mental health, whereas before in the schools, um, we weren't getting that. I think athletes for so long have ran into this issue of not wanting mental health therapy because there's a stigma behind mental health. All of a sudden, though, I have Michael Phelps, Simone Biles, athletes coming out in support of mental health. And if I go up to an athlete and say, I'm a sports psychologist, would you like to have um, some therapy sessions or would you like to work together to decrease anxiety, increase optimal levels? You know, all of a sudden their ears are perking up, and you know. Um, so I, I think there's a lot that we have learned. I think we've learned to be able to access mental health like we're doing today, virtually, um, being able to work with each other, not being so afraid to bring it up. So it's encouraging to see, but at the same point, I think we have learned how important interaction is into being able to work through and find solutions and find coping strategies to your mental health. Great, great, thank you. You know. Um, 
you, you said a few things there. All of you said things there. Really great. But you, you trigger something in stigma, in stigma, right? That kind of thing where, you know, you feel bad saying the one. I'm going to tell you, even me saying out of my mouth, and I'm 53 years old, full with grandchildren, right? Me saying I was depressed, right? And saying I was a depressed high school student feels a lot different than saying I've been a depressed adult. You know, I live with anxiety. I live with depression. You know, I live with uh, attention deficit, right? Uh, I say it's attention giftedness, so long as it's managed, because it comes with literally, I'm a communicator, as you can tell, right? I write jokes in my head all the time, right? I, from a creative standpoint, you know, young people, it helps me with my fashion. You don't have to have the same turtleneck. However, you might like it, right? But it helps me with all these creative things, and it keeps me current. So it's attention giftedness, so long as I address it, it becomes a deficit when it goes unaddressed, when it goes unaddressed. So how do we, um, you know, um, uh, Ricardo, you know, coach, help us understand stigma. How have things changed throughout the years? Do you think that the stigma is still as high or is it starting to, to kind of, uh, kind of, decrease this is the stigma decreasing and what are we doing to help that i think the stigma has definitely decreased um because so many people are um, talking about mental health um, i mean you you see a lot of um, actors professional athletes a lot of people that are are in the spotlight uh, politicians um, and our leaders are talking about mental health I mean, our president is talking about mental health. So I think this stigma has definitely decreased. And I think what we can do is to continue to bring it up, um, sharing our stories about our personal um, issues that we've had and, and things that we've overcome. Um, and I think that helps bring it out of everyone. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Coach, Coach Brent. Or athletics, uh, or the L F oh, wow, that's good. Athletic elementary coordinators. So we are going at all all levels here. I love it. I love that we don't just start. You know, uh, as a side note, uh, many young people start to experience mental health challenges and recognize crisis right at around around age fourteen. Right at around age fourteen. So the, one of the questions, and and we're going to go with you with the same question that I gave uh, Coach Hill, right? But you know, I love the fact that we have folks who are willing to deal with this at all levels, because just because we recognize that folks start to recognize that challenge, those challenges start to manifest itself in, a, in, a, in symptoms and signs right around 14, why would we not front load, right? I always tell people, you don't coach people once they get in, get in the game, right? You coach them up before they get in the game. So that education has to, you know, take place before we jump out there and start. So. Um, Brent, tell me about, you know, stigma. What, what, are, what are your thoughts? Do you think, uh, is the stigma still as strong or, or what are you noticing that's being done, if anything different than uh, Coach Hill? Yeah, I mean, I, I think the stigma is definitely uh, less than it has been. You know, more people are talking about it. You know, one thing in my experience with uh, elementary athletics, uh, the, the successful teams have that one or two kids that are the leaders of the rest of the pack, right? They follow that kid or, or that leader and I think that's one thing that I've seen that's changed, changed is our young people are being leaders for each other. So, you know, they're following their peers. Sometimes, you know, a, a kid will listen to their friend more than their coach or their parent. And um, that's one thing I think we have to continue to encourage to break that stigma is have our young people talk about it together. So, you know, you may not be struggling, but your friend is struggling. Uh, can you reach out to them? Can you be a support system for them? And I did have one question for the group, if I can throw it back at you, uh, Mr. Walton. Uh, for someone that has a friend that's dealing with uh, some challenges, what are some ways that they can kind of help them get through it or encourage them to help? You know, it's when you're personally going through something, you may not want to speak up, but your friend may be that push that you need to kind of get through it. I will allow within the, you know, I've got some outside things, the ways that work, but we have some folks who work within CPS. And you know, this is not a pass or fail. I do have a quiz in my hand, however, 
And I may shoot some of those quiz questions out a little later. Feel, feel free to uh, abstain uh, rather than vote on the quiz if necessary. But uh, with NCPS, what does that system look like? And I will talk about what the outside looks like and some of those other resources. But with NCPS, what would that? I think we have someone who was a either a school psychologist, perhaps, or a school counselor on the call. Help me out. Yeah, both myself and Jacqueline are school psychologists as well. Um, within CPS, we highly encourage that report to start with teachers. So I know school psychologists are not always the most forefront individuals to a student. And we hope that school counselors are a little bit more along the front, forefront, but we know that teachers have the number one rapport with students. So we encourage that that student seeks out that teacher's advice more or less rather than tries to take the issue on themselves. What we've learned is if Yermaya comes to me as his best friend with mental health concerns, I'm going to give Yermaya advice that he probably wants to hear rather than advice that is sound and helpful. Um, so it's one of those things where as a friend, I encourage friends to be supports. Don't be the therapist. You know, seek out that adult, seek out that attention that is necessary for Yermaya and his family. Um, as therapists, we are trained on how to engage that conversation. There's a you know, we kind of have the skill set taught to us from an early, from early on in education of how to engage your mind in that conversation once he does enter into our office or once we have to call home to engage in that conversation. But for friends, my, my message all the time to high school students says that's primarily where I focus my school psychology at is to find that trusted adult to first access that you can kind of be the sounding board, you know, and see how high of an intensity you need to make it. Very good, very good. Anyone else have anything to offer on that? Yeah, I was gonna just chime in on um, what Dr. Hanthorn was speaking about. Um, I definitely agree. I think one of the, my biggest pushes with our um, young people is just making sure everybody has one adult that they connect with. So whether that's a teacher, a support staff member, security, like some of our security, um, they become like, really, really close with a lot of our students, um, lunchroom staff, custodial staff, so whoever it is, we wanna make sure every student has somebody to go to. And so in this situation, I would hope that if you have a friend who's going through something and encouraging them to speak with an adult, a trusted adult would always be my first go-to. I was just gonna also mention that every single Cincinnati Public School has like a mental health partner. Um, and so if you go to the Mind Peace Cincinnati like website, they have every single school and who's assigned and who's like the contact. So that's a really good resource for young people and families in the community. Um, I think that was about it, but but yeah, thank you. I've got a couple commercials uh, free lo front loaded, you know, just in case you did an excellent job. So I don't have to unleash too many of my commercials. Uh, but one of the things that I like to encourage is, and because I'm, I'm a bridge, right? I work with organizations on how to um, turn information into usable kind of material for our intended target. Sometimes it means young people. So I've been that bridge between community and institutions, between young people and teachers and that sort of thing. One thing that I encourage, uh, while we do not encourage young people to become the therapist, but also making certain that young people know the signs and symptoms, right? Some of those signs and symptoms are, right? Not to just dismiss them and not to take on that responsibility. Because if I think I have to become the therapist, that's one thing about myth, mental health, um, uh, youth mental health first aid for just general community members, for coaches, for parents, for all those folks. One thing that we say is you do not have to become the expert. And I think where I made my mistake early on, I was far too early in my presentation to the mentors, I did not share with them that they don't have to be the experts. But the beauty is that today we have resources. So you not only have uh, trusted adults, and my advice to adults all the time is start to build relationships with young people before there is a crisis, right? <laughs> start to build those relationships. And how do we go about doing that? Right now, I'm smiling. I really mean it, right? When I talk to young people, oftentimes I'll take my glasses off so they can see my eyes, even if I can't see them, right? 
and I will I, I walk through, I'll, I'll, I'll wave, I'll give young people a thumbs up, and even the high schoolers, they will accept my corny thumbs up. So I am constantly building relationships. If I have young people who are playing a, on a basketball rim in my community, I start to wave. That way, when they start to curse too loudly outside my window, the first thing I say to them won't be a correction, right? That's general relationship. So one thing that I say is that from an adult standpoint, build relationships um, at the front end for coaches, start to have conversations. Some folks have Wellness Wednesday. They take a moment where, you know, sometimes folks have a moment where they all do what we call some kind of collective self, self-talk, where we all say something that we're grateful for, right? But we always say we're grateful. We show how we're grateful on social media all the time. Everything's always perfect on social media, right? But sometimes we also are, allow ourselves to say something we're struggling with or a challenge that we have, but also leaving that door open at the end. If there are any conversations that perhaps this wasn't a good space for, I am a ready and open person and a safe person to talk to. So. That's what I have to offer. And also in that chat, folks, that 1-800, you know, the suicide prevention hotline um, um, number, they'll also give you referrals and recommendations in your area. So does anyone else have anything to add on that? Okay, all right. Well, I'm gonna move us along just a little bit um, just to make certain that, you know, we get in uh, some things. Let's take a a, a quick um, kind of a signs and symptoms. Um, uh, kind of a, a, a read, read off some of the signs and signs and symptoms and what I like for our panel to be thinking about about maybe a time or two where you've noticed this in other people and sometimes notice it perhaps in yourself. Like I thought that I was just getting old and couldn't sleep. I didn't realize that I was dealing with anxiety. And still I started, I was sitting, it was an aha moment. I was sitting in a training and I'm like, man, I'm gonna help so many young people and I'm gonna spread the word and I'm gonna be an advocate. And I'm like, hmm, what do they know about me, <laughs> right? You know, so I laugh about it and not downplaying mental health, but let's taking off some of that heaviness, right? Sometimes you can recognize and you may see yourself in this reflection. Um, persistent sadness, right? Uh, two or more, uh, for, um, pr prolonged two or more weeks or just kind of knowing your baseline level. You know, what's a standard sad for you? Um, do you just wake up sad or has something happened that, um, that is an understandable challenge. Like for instance, not making a team. Absolutely, that's disappointing. That's absolutely disappointing, right? But is that something that you're having uh, problems recovering from? Uh, withdrawing from or avoiding social interactions, not necessarily wanting to interact with people uh, like usual. One thing we uh, discussed about COVID, that was a struggle within the whole COVID, you know, that social withdrawal, some young people wanted to be around other people. After a while, I don't know about you, but me, because I'm a little older, I had problems interacting with people again. You know, I started to enjoy being by myself a little too much. Um, hurting oneself or thinking about hurting oneself, you know, thoughts of suicide and, you know, suicidal ideation, right? And we don't, people don't commit suicide, they commit crime, right? They die by suicide or they complete suicide. That's part of the, 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 the information we use to take the stigma off, right? As if somehow someone has committed a crime. Um, outbursts or extreme irritability, you know, just, you know, outside of your standard aggravation uh, by your younger siblings, perhaps. Um, out of control behavior that can be harmful. Out of control behavior that can be harmful. Um, that can be substance misuse, right? You know, it can be um, everything from uh, sexual addictions and that sort of thing. Those are a list of things that people use as coping, unhealthy coping mechanisms. Um, drastic changes in mood, behavior, personality, change in eating habits, right? You normally love to eat. You know, there may be a night you don't necessarily feel like eating, but is this a sustained uh, period of time? Um, unintended loss of weight, difficulty sleeping, frequent headaches or stomach aches, and that's something really odd. You don't expect that. Sometimes, especially athletes and other folks, we feel like, hey, they are, they're just complaining. Man, suck it up, suck it up. You'll be okay, and with young ladies, sometimes the pressure can be really extreme because they have to deal with proving that they're a great athlete oftentimes. You know, because the expectation at times that, that the young ladies may not be as great or as tough 
as athletes, as men, so they may uh, mask that, uh, mask that even more so. Difficulty concentrating, changes in academic performance, right? Right? I just can't concentrate. You know, maybe trying my hardest, yet this thing, you know, is just not, it's just not working for me, or avoiding missing school or practice, right? So how about that? Have we seen any of those behaviors in any of our friends, our students, some of the folks who we've interacted with? Does anyone care to give us an example of that, uh, maintaining the safety of, uh, of the uh, protecting the involved? Coach, I'm going to come back to you, Coach. Here. Oh, there you go, Dr. Craig. He saved you for now. <laughs> yeah, no, I think in Jacqueline and I's line of work with um, working with a couple of the CPS schools and then I have kind of ventured out to some of the other schools in the surrounding area. Um, I don't know if I've ever seen athletes with a higher level of anxiety than I've been watching lately. Um, I, I don't. I don't necessarily see that as a trend. I see it more as the times we're in. Um, but I think where I'm seeing is this level of perfection is coming out in today's society, especially our students. I think we have a level of adults that, um, and let's be honest, we live in a city where we are driven by wins and state championships. We are driven by the division one powerhouses in the area um, to excel. And, and, Unfortunately, high school athletics, Coach Hill will talk about it, Coach Stokes at West High. Um, we are we are a um, society that coaches, whether it's there or not, feel a pressure to win. So priority sometimes has to go towards that column of winning, um, which then adds a level of intensity to practice, a level of intensity in your relationship. You know, players can interpret that level um, so then there's becomes this anxiety. Um, I think Annalise was speaking about college earlier. So many of the CPS athletes feel that sports is their way out. Sports is their um, gift to get out of the city, to get college education. They don't necessarily always have that as the, I can do that with or without sports mentality. It is basketball will get me, baseball will get me. Um, so that's added pressure. And then if the performance is not reaching their expectation we see anxiety coming through the roof with a lot of my athletes that I've been working with whether it's me coaching or working as their sports psychologist um, just watching that trend with our young athletes and I think where it's coming into play is going back you made an ex excellent point when you're talking smoking or drinking or a lot of our athletes are turning to vaping and they don't see that as a coping strategy. They see that as the trend of what's cool. Um, but when we take into reality that you're vaping for stress, you're vaping for anxiety, you're vaping for the relief because you don't have coping strategies within yourself that you've practiced. I think um, we have a trend with athletes who think they try a coping strategy once, and that should work. Well, if I watch basketball, football, you're not going to run your route perfectly the first time, nor are you going to beat the defender. You got to work, learn footsteps. You got to learn the field. You know, that takes practice. And I, I think we, we're okay with understanding skill set and practice as a development. I don't think we have gotten the grasp on coping strategies is also practice, whether it's in the moment or proactively practicing. Um, so one of the things that I've highlighted to a lot of coaches is you got to practice. You know, and I, I, just to piggyback on that, if I can, um, I I don't know from a coach's perspective, from from my experience, um, whether I really feel the pressure to win and make that more as a, a mental challenge. Um, I think that in our communities, um, and I'm speaking in our entire district that a lot of our kids feel slighted where um, it could be things that happen in their lives that we don't know. It can be a, a death, it can be a divorce, it can be COVID at home, it can be a sickness, it can be homeless, it can be your lights got shut off. It can, it can be a whole wide, of, wide range of things that could have happened to them. And, and to them, sometimes it's like, this is my life. This is 
another thing that happened. This is what happens to me. And so when we push our kids, um, I see it as not selling for anything in the past. You are as good as anyone else. You can be a state champion. Don't settle for anything. And I think it's more with the coaching aspect of it. I think that's why we push our kids more than feeling the pressure to push them. Good, good. Thank I you. Love what, I'm going to jump back in. I love what he had to say about you, you deserve it. I think that's something we talk a lot in the world of sports psychology, especially um, within CPS, is this feeling of worthy and um, value and you deserve success. So what we have seen is with some athletes is they struggle with too much success. They struggle with a spotlight. So how do I continue success and continue it with 100%? And how do I be comfortable in the spotlight or how do I be comfortable in my success and and also how do i be comfortable with maybe students in my building not liking my success you know how do i we've had issues where we have teams in the district playing for regionals or districts in basketball and kids are coming at them in a ruthless manner um, not necessarily supporting them but maybe coming at them a little harder you know so now we got athletes that can't just focus on the game ahead and the task ahead they got to worry about day to day, keeping their level head. And, you know, so I, I think there's so much to go there, but I love what Coach Hill had to say in, in regards to you're worthy of success and making that not just a conscious thought, but an unconscious mindset. Great, great. Now we've got just about four minutes left here and oh, it goes so fast. So we'll definitely have to come back and really dig into this because we've got far more. And I know that Jeremiah and Annalise have, you've got everything to say. So, but one thing that I'd really like for you to grasp, let me double check, make sure I'm not missing a note here. Okay, great. Yeah, we're there. So one thing that I'd love for us to, to kind of gain here as we're thinking about social media and it, it allows us to kind of make it down our list a little bit. Um, but for social media, help me out. Um, I'll take anybody, but I'm, I'm really looking at Jeremiah and Annalise, but feel free not to feel anxiety. If you want to say I'll pass, that is completely uh, okay. It's fine. But I can't imagine if I had taken that L, hurt my arm on social media, if I would have had more than just those news articles, and if I would have been able to blast my success out on social media, Way back in 1995, 1996, whenever I entered myself, that would have been completely devastating for me. Uh, either of you, do you think social media has an impact on that anxiety and stress? I personally think it does. I think what it does is it creates a lot of highs and lows. It can put you really up and make you feel amazing for some periods of time. But then, like you said, if you had a blast of something terrible you did, it can cause everything to crash down. However, it's great to have that outlet so you can talk to more friends and maybe not do it in person if you're not comfortable with that. And so I think that can help with mental health somehow. Mm -hmm. But then there's also the bad side where there's people reaching out to you who you do not want to reach out. So I feel like it creates big highs and lows. Good stuff. Thank you. You're my anything. Yeah, I agree. And then, like you said, creating that idea of perfection that social media plays a big role in that because people are seeing these things and looking at everybody else's version of their life and comparing it to their own and seeing how they may have came up short or they're not the same as them. So that creates a little bit of anxiety to be like everybody else. But it also there are some positives to it, like your widespread communication. You can reach out to people across the world when you feel me like you can't always talk to those people or those are people that you confide in or that you trust in those people are always accessible because of social media but it's all about not getting too consumed in it because it can like she like Annalise said it could take you to all-time highs and all-time lows you know what thank you for that because i just had a thought that is that um uh, attention giftedness, right? <laughs> I have these visions um, and it's probably going to be a little more exciting to me than everybody else. But for years upon years, we've told young people, watch your circle, keep your circle, right? 
So I guess if you treat your social media circle the same way, then you know if you need a certain empowerment that you deal with that, this, you know, maybe this chat group or maybe this group of folks that you communicate with on social media. So I guess it would be kind of the same thing, but thank you for giving us kind of the uh, ups and downs of it. Um, so I think we have, uh, see if, if, I'm, if, if I'm understanding my communication correctly, I think folks are letting me know that we have just a little bit more time, just a little bit more time. So I will take some of that time. If not, we'll call it my fault. Um, Brent, anything? Yeah, I mean, I, I think from, you know, what I've heard from, from Coach Hill and, uh, you know, Dr. Han, Hanthorn there and uh, Jeremiah and Annalise, it, it's just there, there's a balance you have to have in life, right? You know, you, you want to win, you want to uh, get that state championship, go far in the playoffs, but you can't have that be the only thing that you're concerned about. You have to bring other things to the equation, uh, realize what you're going to get from from going through those those tough times or, or that struggle to, to you know be successful in life so same with social media right you have to be balanced in how much you consume that information so uh, one, one thing that just came to mind is just having that balanced lifestyle um, is just so important when when dealing with struggles in life yeah I mean imagine uh, you know and and that kind of empathetic approach if we're looking for that empathetic approach you know really understanding that we've got a, um, um, that, you know, we're going to really remove stigma. Sometimes social media doesn't encourage that. Like imagine, just think about um, substance substance use, right? Think about the use of marijuana with Michael Phelps. And um, who was the young lady, the track runner, not long ago who missed the Olympics, young people? Do you remember her name? Somebody help me out with that. Jerry Richardson. Absolutely, absolutely, right? You know, when I saw folks go in, I'm like, man, where's the compassion? Because we're talking about trauma as well. And that response, Michael Phelps is just now coming out and saying, man, I've been going through some stuff for a long time. But what we saw was a substance misuse, right? Think about, um, not only Simone Biles, um, but, uh, oh, I had her name down earlier. That's why I didn't put it in my notes. The young lady far before Simone Biles, that the great Olympic champion, she was a dynamo and folks wanted to talk about her hair. Young African-American young lady, help me out, coaches, right? Oh, I'm gonna have to look it up because I'm, I'm confusing some other, somebody, did, did you send, you should have sent me that in a, in a text, Steve. I know you know who I'm talking about. Steve knows almost everything, but Imagine a young man having to not take anything away from the, from the pressures. Yeah, Gabby Douglas, thank you. Yes, I knew someone had my back. Gabby Douglas, imagine here you have exhibited the performance of a life, this thing you've been waiting for your entire life. So you win gold medals and people want to talk about your hair. Have you ever seen a young man, someone discuss a young man's hair after he just won a championship? You know, so we've got those added uh, pressures. So I also want to point out that oftentimes we think about young men and anxiety. However, in among athletes, uh, research shows that young ladies suffer from a higher uh, level of, of anxiety, statistically. You know, this isn't just Sean Walton. Uh, but so I know we've got to wrap up here. Uh, I'm going to leave us with, with a few things and I'll give, let our panel uh, give us a few final thoughts. And but I look for, you know, we're really we've got a lot more here that we could really get in. I don't want to overstay my welcome. Young people, I'd say a bunch of old country things like overstaying my welcome. Please forgive me, but I, I can't help it, okay? So, but without overstaying my welcome, welcome, I want to remember that we're talking to everybody as a community resource. All the folks around you, there is a video link. Um, it is for a young man, uh, Hunter Holmes, who completed suicide. I had a concussion. And just a bunch of things were going on. It's kind of a, a terrible chain of events. Um, and he was a, a, a three sport letter person. He was a three sport letter person, had a lot going on. And I believe it was in 2017 that he completed suicide. And as a result, his parents and his whole community put this video together. And the beauty about this video is they show everyone from the custodian to the coach, the teacher, and they have these little word bubbles over their head. And they talk about all that they've gone through, 
someone just lost someone, someone's searching for their father, someone's being uh, ashamed about sexual behavior, someone's being lied on, some, uh, a teacher doesn't have the ability to have children of her own. So it just shows a commonness that we're all going through something to help uh, remove the stigma. So I'd like for everyone to know at least go through, I gave you some of those signs and symptoms, uh, spend some time on the internet familiarizing yourself with the signs and symptoms. Don't worry about being over vigilant. We're not asking you to diagnose, but if, if you know, we can always ask the question, are you okay? Um, uh, you know, we can always say, you seem different, but that comes with relationship, right? We don't want to assign behaviors, but we can always say, you seem different. So we want to remember relationship, have a relationship, recognition, recognize what those symptoms are and respond by seeking help from the adults around you and adult professionals. We want to make sure that we have care, concern, connect, um, and, and connect. And coaches, you have a special carrot. With a guy like me, my relationship is a carrot. But you actually have a relationship and a carrot because they, because you have something that young people want. So thank you today. Uh, my name is Sean Walton Sr. And I'm a guy who talks about stuff and is not willing to, sh not uh, ashamed of sharing his story. So thank you so much. Now we have Asia. Thank you so much, Sean Walton Sr. Uh, thank you all for watching and joining in on our Facebook Live as we hosted our first Beyond the Game series, Let's Talk Mental Health. Big thanks to Walton Mobile Healthcare Solutions and, of course, Tisha O'Connell, who is from our District Office of Communication and Engagement. Stay tuned for our next session for Beyond the Game. We'll be talking nutrition, and that session will take place on December the 15th. Student athletes, if you're having any mental health challenges, please say something to someone. Talk to your counselor, talk to your coaches, talk to your athletic directors, your teachers, contact performance psychology. Heck, you can even contact me, but talk to someone. So thanks again, and we'll see you next time, December 15th. Let's talk nutrition.